I'm Alex Ortiz, a reporter with the Herald News and Joliet, here for the uh, conversation with the two candidates running to represent the Illinois 97 House District. Uh, here with us, we have the incumbent, State Representative Mark Batnick from Plainfield, and uh, the challenger, Democrat Harry Benton, who is a Plainfield uh, Village trustee. Um, thank you, gentlemen, both for joining us today to talk about these important issues ahead of the election. Um, first, I just want to start, uh, jump right into kind of the politics of the moment. and. Um, want to hear kind of about what the arguments that you two are making, uh, considering the state, uh, the, the state of the state, I guess, is here. Well, let me start with you, uh, Representative Batnick, since you're the incumbent. You know, uh, especially before the pandemic, you know, Democrats uh, got a lot done. You know, they raised the minimum wage, legalized marijuana, big capital bill. Um, there's obviously a, a graduated uh, tax amendment on the ballot um, uh, for this fall. So I just want to hear kind of, you know, they have a lot to brag about. So what is your argument as the opposition party, as a Republican? Why should Democrats um, continue to remain in power, or not continue to remain in power? And why should your party, what is your, the argument your party has uh, for this election? Well, one party rule has been disastrous for the economy uh, and the budget of this state for, you know, a decade, decade and a half. We have a massive outmigration of people. Um, you see Madigan in the news uh, daily, uh, different corruption scandals, whether it be sexual harassment, whether it be the ComEd scandal, um, whether it be we just had something with the Chicago Teachers Pension Fund come out. Um, so let's be honest, this, this race is about Madigan and corruption. My opponent's taking a whole bunch of money from Madigan. He has not denounced him. He's going to vote for him for speaker. And until we address the corruption issue in Illinois, Everything else is everything else is uh, it, it, it's secondary. You can't really fix it. So that's really the elephant in, in the room. Until we address until we address corruption, we're going to keep having the issues that we have. Okay, uh, Mr. Ben, what is your argument for filling the seat? Obviously, Representative Benick has been there since I believe he's first elected in 2012, correct? Uh, I, I took office in January 2015. 2015. Okay, sorry. Um, so what is your argument? What are the arguments you're making to voters in the 97th district? Well, uh, some of the things that we have to work on is uh, we have to work on uh, getting trained vocational programs back into schools and, and create opportunities for uh, kids that either don't want to go to college or don't have the opportunity to go to college. And there needs to be uh, just other avenues for them to be successful in their lives. Uh, we need to work on income and property tax relief. I know my taxes keep going up on a regular basis. Uh, we also need to work on uh, more affordable health care and, and protecting the access to health care. It's something that people are struggling with right now, especially with COVID, uh, people losing their jobs. There are, are uh, young people that are turning 26 and losing insurance through their provider and their parents, and they're having a hard time trying to find jobs, jobs with benefits. So we have to make sure that we are driving economic growth within the state. And yes, we do need to take on corruption. We need to work on uh, making sure that we hold people accountable. Uh, we need to make sure that there's ethics reform. Uh, we can look at campaign finance reform. We can look at uh, a potential of fair mapping. We have to take on things and we have to make it equitable across the state. That way, each district has good representation and we have to take a look at the budget. We have to audit, audit line by line and make sure that we get rid of waste. We have to get back on track. Right now, things are broken. And my goal is to get it back on track. There's too many families that are suffering right now. Okay. Um, I, I would imagine, obviously, we're gonna talk a lot about kind of the controversy surrounding the speaker, um, since I know, uh, Representative Bannock, you've been uh, very vocal about this. So, uh, Mr. Ben, I'm just gonna ask you, because I know when I asked your campaign before, I don't think I really got a direct answer. So I'll just, Try to pin you down now. Do you think that because of this bribery scandal that the speaker has been uh, linked to, do you think that Michael Madigan should resign either his House seat, his speakership, or his uh, being chair of the Democratic Party of Illinois? Well, some of the things we have to look at is just what I mentioned. We have we have to work on ethics reform. We have to hold people accountable. If somebody's uh, caught in in the middle of a, a crime or ended up being indicted and convicted, then they need to pay back every single taxpayer dollar. They need to be held accountable and they need to be prosecuted to the extent of the law. And I support that right now within the party uh, with 
with Arroyo and Sandoval and Link, and I, I want them to resign, and I want them to, to make sure that they are prosecuted. Uh, we need to make sure that there is due process and we need to let due process rain out, but we need to make sure that there's every single opportunity right now because there are other people announcing uh, for the run for speakership and there could be multiple people that end up announcing. Okay, well, I'm gonna ask you for that, but to, 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 just to be clear, I ask you, do you think the speaker should step down from either his post speaker, his house seat, his chair uh, role as leader of your party? Do you think he should be the one who resigns right now? Well, this is a lot of stuff that's happening on, on the side of my opponent. So it's a uh, partisan game to take away from the actual races that are happening throughout the state. It's no matter what district you're in, that is the tactic of the Republicans and, and they're pinning that. The race is between Mark and me within the district of the 97. We need to make sure that we focus on this race and we focus on the people within the 97th and I'm focused on winning this race. It, everything is a, a moot point if I don't end up winning. So we need to make sure that uh, myself and my staff, we're focused on the campaign and we're getting out there, we're knocking doors, we're talking to people, making sure that their voice is heard. Okay, well, I guess I still didn't get an answer, but and just real quick, would you, if you were elected, would you vote for the speak, uh, Michael Madigan to be speaker again? We have to look at all the options. There's already somebody else that announced. There could be multiple people that announced. So uh, it's it's putting the cor uh, the horse or the cart before the horse, and there could be potentially a lot of different options. So we have to look at those options going forward. But it, again, it's a moot point if if I don't end up winning. I have to get out there and I have to focus on the race. Okay. Uh I guess it wasn't an emphatic uh, guess there, but okay, so Representative Bannock, so you obviously made a lot of this, um, and I want to hear your argument, but I also want to kind of talk about um, uh, really the politics of this, because I hear a lot when it comes about, when it comes to um, uh, donations to campaigns, and it's a lot of the stuff that sounds bad, but, you know, I guess let's, just, let's start here. What is your argument about why uh, tying your opponent to the speaker is such a big deal? Why, why should voters care about this? He says it's a moot point. I, I can't believe the absurdity of this. It's the first vote you take. How many decades does the speaker need to be in power before you realize he's not going to let any serious reforms happen? How many scandals need to come out? I, I can't believe you actually sat there and, and, and told the reporter that line of BS. It's a moot point. It's the most important point. It's the most important vote you take as a, as a state rep. It's scandal after scandal after scandal. So essentially what you are saying, you are saying that until he's, he's taken out in handcuffs, he's going to remain in, speaker, at, in the speakership. That's, that's your standard. Look, we need to be held to a higher standard. And there were, there, there were Republicans that were in, in, in trouble recently, and, and I immediately said they, they should step aside. Look, if you have a police officer that is under investigation for doing something wrong, you remove him from the streets. If you have a school teacher that's under investigation for doing something wrong, you remove that person from the classroom. But for some reason, the speaker who's involved in a bribery scandal that's involved in billions of dollars, you're just going to say it's a moot point? Did you really just, I, I mean, I, I'm blown away. I'm blown away because you are getting hugely funded. You have the machine behind you. So it's absolutely possible with all the lies you are saying in the ads and, and re ridiculous things that you, it is possible that you can, can win this seat. And it is sad that you don't have the ability to stand up to something that is so blatantly wrong. And it is an incredible character flaw. Uh, can, I, I would, can I respond to that? Sure, go ahead. Yeah, you talk about character and standing up. Uh, September 21st, I asked you to call for the resignation of Amy Grant, who spoke against my friend, Ken Mejia Beal, uh, that said, racist and homophobic remarks and you haven't said anything about it you haven't called for a resignation you're the floor leader a member of your caucus came out against a friend of mine and said homophobic and racist remarks and you haven't said anything about it i'll answer it very clearly very clearly right now i absolutely denounce the words that that amy grant said number one Number two, the Daily Herald heard the entire, the entire thing, and that newspaper kept their endorsements. So that, that, that tape was 
spliced and edited according to the according to the Daily Herald. So you want Amy Grant to to resign over some words from a spliced tape, but you can't say anything about Speaker Madigan and a two point three billion dollar bribery deal that ComEd admitted to bribery. It, to, to to kind of equate those just blows me away. Okay, well, I, I, I'll be honest with you, I'm not as familiar about that particular scandal as, as, as others, but uh, Representative Bandick, I want to ask you kind of about the, the politics of this, because, um, again, I, I want to get to why, why voters should really care about this, because it's, it's been, you know, the speaker's been pretty low-hanging fruit for your party for, for many, many years. Um, the alleged scandals are, are, are pretty numerous, but he's managed to stay in power. Um, he likely will stay in power. Uh, Republicans have really not been able to use this as, as in terms of electoral success, is, it really hasn't worked. So um, is this message really resonating with voters? And, and if not, why should it? Well, it, look, a, a lot of the stuff that we're talking about, we're not gonna get serious campaign finance reform until the speaker is removed. We're not gonna get gerrymandering uh, reform until the speaker is removed. And there are so many small things that he does, levers that he pulls to use government he leverages government to change the political landscape. And one of the reasons that he's been able to stay in power is, I mean, you look at the, the Chicago Teacher Pension Fund issue, he's been able to, and if you look at the Comet issue, he's been able to build an army of workers that work on campaigns that get jobs at, at all these different agencies. And, and in some cases, you know, no-show no show jobs at Comet is, is what's coming out in that scandal. So he, it, it, to, to go, go against that army is, is an incredibly difficult thing. So obviously he, he may have electoral success. It doesn't mean it's the right thing to do. And obviously Stephanie Kipwood has stepped up. There are several Democrats that have stepped up and said, you know what, enough is enough. And I'm sure there's more that are, are afraid to uh, do anything. I applaud the ones that have been willing to step out against uh, Speaker Madigan. I want to say there's maybe a half a dozen, uh, seven, eight. There never was that before. You know, two years ago, there was one. Uh, the, the, the time before that, there was one. Now it's, now it's building to a crescendo. Look, it, it's time. If it, isn't, if it isn't obvious to somebody that's involved in this, I, I, don't know what else, I don't know what else to tell you. People are running their own lives. A lot of people don't understand it. It resonates with people that have the ability to pay attention. But so much of, of races are nationalized these days that, um, you know, people often vote on national issues instead of state issues. But if you were to step back and if Illinois was, was a nation state and we didn't have all the federal stuff that was going on and, and, our, and our social media and our news and our headlines were dominated with what's going in the state, I mean, it would be an embarrassment. What, the way Springfield is run is an embarrassment and we certainly need change. Someday we're going to get it. I'm just hoping it's sooner than later. Okay, can can let's stick on the point about kind of the structural reforms. I know you, you talk a lot about this, but you know when you talk about campaign finance, um, like what are the specific things that you think need to happen that, that need to change? Or... Sure, that, that that that's a great question. I appreciate that. So, for example, the the the, the speaker when they passed campaign finance reform in 2011 made a rule that the heads of party can donate as much as they want to a candidate, but individuals can't. So it, 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 it consolidates power towards the top. Um, there's, there are so many workarounds around, around caps. Um, so it, just in terms of campaign finance reform, the, the, the fact that he had the ability to call something reform, which consolidated his power, is amazing. It is, it is, it is, it is masterful from a political standpoint. If, 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 if you look at it from that point, I mean, it's bad for the public but it's a masterful stroke that he was actually able to pass reform that gave him more power than what he had before that reform. Okay, all right, Mr. Ben, uh, respond to whatever you want to respond to there, but I also want to hear from you. Uh, get more into the specifics. What are the specific things from a structural standpoint that you think need to change in Springfield to uh, put an end to corruption? Yeah, I've, I'm perfectly fine with, uh, with making sure that people have more of an ability to uh, finance campaigns uh, because it should be the people for the people. Uh, we need to make sure that we take a lot of this corporate interest out. There's there's special PACs and lobbying groups that end up donating, which you know I'm I am not taking special interest money. What I do is I take money from 
the party and unions because I'm union and personal and individual uh, contributions. I want to make sure that there is no conflict of interest. And I want to make sure going forward that we can look at that. We can also look at caps on how much you can finance. Uh, we need people that are going to step up and represent the people instead of party interest and make sure that we step up and they're not protecting special interests. They're protecting the people that elect them and they're working for the people that elect them. And I'm all for that. And then we also need to make sure that we don't have lobbyists that are coming right out and just rolling or, uh, uh, legislators that are coming straight out and becoming lobbyists. That's becoming a conflict of interest. And then they end up putting money into campaigns and they end up uh, changing the outcome of a lot of these individual races. So, so, so would you uh, support like, a, like a, at least a, a ban for so, so many years after somebody gets out of the legislature, they can't become a, a lobbyist? Yeah, I want to put in a more uh, moratorium to make sure that it doesn't happen because it is a huge conflict of interest when that happens. If you end up getting out, you're lobbying the very people that you're friends with that, that you've been in the legislation with. Okay, uh, uh, to, on, the, on the lobbying point, so Representative Bannock, do, uh, is that, is that a, what you think should happen or do you think more should be done? Uh, 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 of course it is, but the speaker controls what bills get called. I mean, this is silly. I, we need term limits. I have a bill for retroactive term limits. The speaker bottled it up in rules committee. There's been plenty of bills on lobbying ban. The speaker doesn't let those be called to the floor. So to say it's a moot point, who's speaker? He controls. I mean, how many decades does he need to be in power for us to say that we need all these things that that you know every every Democrat wants to say they're fighting for? But oh golly gee, it didn't happen because they keep electing the same person as speaker who manipulates the system, and the system is being manipulated for his own benefit. Okay. Well, I. I Mr. Ben, I guess try to address that because you know, yes, I, I'm not going to answer but kind of about the speaker point. You say it's a moot point. Um, at least on these reform bills, to the representative's point about them just not coming up because the speaker controls that. Um, would you push for bills like that to come up? Is it going to be just? Oh yeah, I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm sponsoring bills like that. Like I said, I'm a, I, I'm the chief sponsor i wrote the bill for retroactive term limits i'm on bills for for lobbying bans for the transitions of of lobbying, lobbying bans uh but one of the reasons why i i really support term limits there's a lot of things that we can do but you know arroyo broke the law uh sandoval broke the law if you can write laws people can break them but if you have if you have term limits in place um people can't hang around long enough to, to break the law. And one of the, one of the issues that happens is, is people get their little fiefdoms. They, they get their little state rep seat in whatever part of the state that it is. They build up a war chest. They're on whatever committee. I think Sandoval was on the, on, uh, uh, the transportation committee. So you have, you have uh, uh, people who, who donate a lot of money to them who benefit by bills either being stopped or passed through the transportation committee. So nobody in the state knows who Senator Marty Sandoval is, but he builds, builds up that little fiefdom, which is why the only solution to that is retroactive term limits. Okay. Well, Mr. Benton, what about retroactive term limits? What do you think about that? Well, I'm willing to look at any term limit bill. I'm going in, I make more money in the private sector than going into uh, becoming a legislator. I want to make sure that that everybody has opportunities, my family and every other family within the district. This isn't something I'm going into to make money. I can make more money in the private sector. And uh, it's for the people. You should get in and get out and you should make sure that you're representing the people who are electing you. I'm, I'm perfectly fine with looking at that legislation going forward. Well, address the, uh, your opponent's point about, you know, you say, you know, he says, you know, you can't really say the, the speakership is kind of a moot point because he's just not going to bring up the bill. So if you get elected, would you push for bills like that to be brought up? Yeah, I'm willing to push for anything bipartisan to get back on track. I, I don't care if somebody's a Democrat or a Republican. I'm willing to work with anybody in the state that's willing to get the state back on track. And I think instead of voting against budgets on a regular basis, we should sit down and we should all go bipartisan across the budgets, make sure that they're balanced, make sure that we go forward and we get it back on track. Because right now it's broken. Illinois is broken. 
I've got a two-year-old and a two-month-old and the, the future has to change. It has to change for everybody to be uh, equitable and make sure that they can be profitable and successful within their own lives. And we have to get back on track. And that means everybody pushing aside the, uh, the party lines and working on this budget to get back on track, working on new ideas to try to drive business in, working on new ideas to make sure that our youth is successful in new jobs coming out. Uh, one of the things that I'm pushing for is CJA to make sure that we have clean energy, to make sure that this is an opportunity for- The, the Clean Energy uh, Jobs Act, right? Correct, yes. Uh, to make sure that we have new innovative jobs that are gonna be long-term. These are opportunities for our youth to get into good jobs without getting into debt. That way they can get into houses sooner, they can get into starting their families sooner instead of getting into $100,000 worth of student loans and end up backtracking their life because they're in debt right when they come out of school. Okay, um, I want to, Representative Bannock, you brought up the issue of, of, of fair maps and, and just to give people some context here, you know, this is talking about the state legislatures with uh, every 10 years after the census, they redraw uh, legislative districts at the state and federal level, I believe. And, you know, in a lot of cases, especially in Illinois and other, in other states, it's, it's basically whoever is in control of the legislature is in control of the map drawing. And obviously the argument from Republicans is that uh, with Democrats in control, they can gerrymander these districts to make it so that Democrats uh, basically just have a built-in advantage. Um, so I guess the solution for you is to have an independent map drawing process, right? I think there's several solutions and I offered some creative ones. Um, there's an independent map drawing solution. The Iowa model has a little bit of that and it has rules where lines have to go north, south, east, west for a certain amount of time. Uh, there's something called a, a, a splitting algorithm where you start with the number of districts uh, in the state and you, you cut the state in, in half and then into pieces in half beyond that depending on how many districts you need to you, you need to draw. So it's literally just a math formula. Uh, but you're right. I, this is one of those situations where when Republicans are in charge in Republican states, they do it. When Democrats are in charge of Democratic states, they, they do it. Um, so there's a couple of solutions to solve that. So we can't, we can't do this pointing back and forth. Number one, you could do it at a national level, which I support. Um, the one conversation I had with uh, President Obama was, was regarding uh, gerrymandering nationally. And then the other solution was with, with Illinois, one, you could just have a fair map uh, process for the, for the state house and state senate seats, and then you know do the uh, congressional seats, which affect the balance of power nationally differently. Or what you could do is you could find a, a dance party, you could find a Republican state, you could pass similar legislation so that you don't change the balance of power nationally. So you don't necessarily need 50 states to have a fair mapping system, but if two states partner up that are kind of on each side of the aisle and do the right thing for the, for the people, a state like Georgia that's about the same size as Illinois, for example, where we have a similar mapping system as long as, as, as they do so that we don't change that national balance of power. So there's a lot of ways to do it. I just know that when you have congressional districts that have long stretches that are the width of a street, um, or you have fingers that go from downtown Chicago out to farmland in Will County for state rep seats or congressional districts. That, that's just not good for the public. Okay. Um, Mr. Ben, so uh, what do you think about kind of the legislative district drawing process? Uh, do you think it should be a partisan endeavor? Uh, I think that should be done at a bipartisan level. We need to take a look at some federal legislation, make sure that uh, there's no voter suppression that's happening for, for uh, lower income communities or um, uh, black and brown communities that are disproportionately drawn out or pushed out of their voting process. Uh, we need to make sure that if the legislation is put up in a Republican state that's Republican controlled, uh, my opponent even talked about bills being called to the floor. What's to say that they call it from the floor uh, to make sure that the power is taken out too. And just remember, take a look at my district. My district was drawn for a Republican. So I'm dealing with gerrymandering right now. So I wanna make sure that everyone that is on the ballot has an opportunity and may the best person win. Everybody deserves the right to be on the ballot, whether they're a Democrat, a Republican or an independent. And we need to make sure that it's fair across the board. 
Okay, uh, let's talk about the other thing that's on the ballot uh, for November, uh, which is the so-called fair tax, this uh, proposed change to the state constitution to allow graduated income tax at the state level. Um, Mr. Benton, do you think, uh, do you support this? Is this something that uh, voters uh, should vote yes on? And if so, why? Well, I'm glad it's on the ballot because it, it takes it out of the hands of the politicians and puts it in the hands of the people and it gives them the opportunity to have a voice. So I want to make sure that they do all their, their due diligence, look at all the information, look at the real information that's out there. Uh, there's, there's a campaign against it where there is uh, a lot of information that is misinformed. Make sure that you're looking for good information and that it is factual and do what's best for your family and make sure that uh, it will work out in the future for you and again, your family, but we have to take a look and make sure that, uh, if this does pass, that retirement income is not taxed. We have to make sure that, that taxes aren't raised on the middle class. I want this to be profitable for their family, because if, if you end up putting a hundred dollars in the pocket of a family that could create up to $500 worth of local economic economic stimulation, helping small businesses within the community, helping local municipalities with services. So the more money you put in the people of po uh, pockets of people, that doesn't become uh, mandatory. It becomes voluntary to go and spend your own money within your community. So we're looking at this and we could see a potential of 97% of Illinoisans seeing either the same rate or a reduction in rates, and they just have to vote what's best for them. Okay, all right, Representative Bandek, I know you, you have talked about this before. So this graduate income tax, this is a good idea? Yeah, you know, the, the, the best information he mentioned, I wish we had the best information out there. What's, what's missing from the debate is what's called the dynamic analysis. So you can do a static analysis, which means everybody stays where they are, income stay where they are. So we're just, the, the idea is, is it's, it's a, a, a very small uh, potential cut for the middle class as it stands right now in the static time, and then a significant increase as you, go, as you go up the income level. But as we know, people are leaving the state. And if, if you are in one of those higher income brackets, um, it, this will be a big tax increase on you. A lot of small businesses will be taxed on it. So if you want to talk about $100 doing $500 worth of local economic growth, what happens if that business owner moves his business and re relocates, because he has the financial ability to do that to a no-tax state like Tennessee and Florida, which we know is happening, and he takes that job and that person, that person goes from uh, uh, paying uh, you know, this income tax on a certain amount of income to losing his job. That's what's happening. So a dynamic analysis would take into account what, who's going to backfill the money when people continue to leave. This is not going to attract more small businesses or big businesses or, or job creators to the state. The, the, this passing this legislation will not do that. We already have a, a we already have an overall climate that is negative. We see the numbers of, of net out migration. So you can do little calculators. There's a lot of things that you can do, but I, I've not, and this was a, a question that I asked the speaker directly on the floor when he presented it once. I asked him if, if, he, if he could tell me the dynamic analysis of what the actual net change is in income to the state. And he didn't have an answer to that question. And I haven't had anybody come up with an answer to the question. So that's the real, if you're gonna have an honest, there, 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 are, there are states like Minnesota that, that are well-run democratic states that do have a progressive income tax, but they also have a lot of things that are more attractive to small, medium, and large businesses that, that we don't have. So in an environment where we're losing higher income uh, earners at a pretty pretty substantial rate day after day, this is a, this is a very dangerous thing to do. But it, I, I understand what you're saying about, you know, just the, the realities of people's incomes, it, it, you know, it's, it's more complicated than just uh, taxing higher incomes, but um, is not at least the principle of those who make more should pay a little bit more? Is, is it not a legitimate reason to have a progressive? Yeah, so it's funny. That's, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up that I get to stay this, stay, stay this, say this publicly. What matters is what's going to help people, right? So if, if you feel it, it's, it's, if, if, the, if the principle of something 
ends up hurting the middle class more, but I, I, would, I would rather have the middle and lower class helped more. I'd rather have more jobs. I'd rather have more people in the state. I'd rather have, have that, that income. Our, our, our goal shouldn't be what we feel is right. Our goal should be what actually happens in the end to the middle class. And the way I look at this, it, it only takes a handful of people to move out of the state for that to have to creep down to the middle class to make up the difference for all the, for all the money that is left. So I, I'm, I'm, more, I'm more concerned about, um, about the long-term effect for everybody. I want the best outcome for every group. I don't want a bill that just feels good, but then has a negative effect for that group. Okay, so I guess, Mr. Ben, uh, if you were elected, how would you, or what would you like to see to ensure that this legislation, uh, if, it, if it's passed, does what its, uh, its supporters say it will do? How, how we can make sure that only those who can pay more uh, will be able to, are the ones who are affected and that this will actually help the state's finances. Yeah, uh, I wanna work on making sure that the middle class isn't being overly taxed. I will, uh, do not want to increase taxes on the middle class. I do not wanna increase taxes on people who are already struggling right now in lower income brackets. I wanna make sure that uh, retirement income is not tax. We have people that are going into a fixed income or in a fixed income, and that tax rate could be make or break for putting food on the table. So I will always protect the middle class and fight for them to make sure that they don't see a disproportionate increase within uh, income tax. And we've seen a stagnant growth within flat tax. Uh, we, if if this doesn't end up passing, we're going to see. Uh, probably a potential increase for everybody across the board. There's a potential that a retirement income uh, tax could, or uh, retirement could be taxed. Uh, we have AERP that's actually endorsing this uh, to make sure that retirement income is not taxed. We have um, the movement right now that's, that's going against the fair tax that as part of the uh, coalition in Chicago is proposing a 1% increase across the board and taxing retirement income. So that that's the, the strategy against the fair tax is they want to tax everyone and tax retirement income. I don't want to see that. And for economic growth, we do need to take some models from some other states and we need to start working on legislation that's going to drive more business in because that creates more jobs and that creates more growth within local communities, which improves services, improves opportunities, improves access for uh, insurance and retirement benefits through these employers that are coming in. And it's all about growth. You have to grow. If you're not growing, you're dying. And the out migration that we're seeing, we're seeing a lot of young people that just aren't finding jobs there that are migrating now. We're seeing people that are uh, potentially 50 to 70,000 is, is the average that is out migration. This isn't large numbers of of high income people because there's good opportunities here in Illinois. But one of the things that, that I do want to focus on is that uh, Green Energy Jobs Act to make sure that we start driving more business there. We start driving more products in. We try, start working towards a good future that's going to be sustainable. I also want to start working on why don't we have more uh, technological advances here. We have uh, a town, a small town of South Bend, Indiana, that has one of the largest data banking centers. We can start driving in more, more tech firms. We can start driving in more people. We've seen it happen from uh, California to Colorado. A lot of them were moving there. Uh, one of those reasons was the, the passing of legalized cannabis that, that started driving growth. Uh, which with that being here in the state, that could potentially drive more uh, technological jobs to the state. So we need to start uh, reaching out to these companies and driving them in and put in legislation that, that is a little bit more favorable to do business in Illinois. Uh, one of the when, things- when you, when you say, you know, more favorable, you know, uh, I, I want to hear your, your argument uh, against what Republicans say that, you know, just raising uh, the the, condition that we're in as a state right now is just not really good for business. Um, it is driving up, you know, companies and whatnot. So when you say uh, you want to support stuff that helps 
the business environment here. Um, I guess if you want to talk about the fair tax, how, how does that help? Or are there any other things that you think need to be done? It sounds like you're talking about more state investment with that yeah, revenue. Yeah, and, and we're seeing that with uh, capital bill and infrastructure. We need to improve our infrastructure. We've got the largest inland port in the country right in Elwood, and the infrastructure has been decimated. Uh, they, there's a huge expansion project over there. Uh, they are continually expanding. We are seeing more power plants. There's one being built in Elwood right now. There's another proposal. We need to make sure that, that um, uh, we fight for our nuclear power too, because that could displace uh, potentially thousands of jobs as well. And we need to start putting in potential legislation like Indiana. If you move a business to Indiana, one of the things that they do is you have to create a company or you have to buy a certain percentage of your materials within the state. So what that does is that helps create new jobs and new companies because if you start a company, say you're making uh, air conditioners, maybe somebody is making the actual casing, casing or they're doing tool and die, or you have a company that's making pallets, it's keeping money in the state and it's creating more growth within the state, which helps more and more businesses and drives in more tax revenue. Okay, all right. So, uh, Representative Bannock, I want to hear you kind of tackle this argument of, well, you know, maybe the state needs more revenue because we need to make more investments in infrastructure, education, et cetera. What, what do you make of that argument? Well, I mean, to, to address it, it all starts with that migration. The, the people leaving the state are much higher income earners than the people uh, moving into the state. And it's true that the, the, the young people are, uh, you know, we are one of the, we're either first or second in exporters of, of, of college, uh, 40 year university students, which is horrible because they see opportunities. But what you have to understand is, is when, when, job, when one job creator leaves the state, he brings dozens, sometimes hundreds of jobs with him. And that's, that, that's what's happening. So until you address that, until you address, uh, until you address all the issues, of, of, of the job creators leaving, leaving the state, you're just going to have more of it. And, and taxing them more certainly doesn't, certainly doesn't, doesn't help the situation. There's, you know, we, we, need, um, we need work comp reform, which is something that wouldn't cost money. It's not a spend. There are states like Massachusetts that actually provide a better outcome to the injured worker. Our system is court heavy. It's, it, it's, it's a system with a lot of friction in it. It's not that we have good outcomes. It's not that we're, 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 we're paying a lot of money and getting a good outcome for the, for the injured worker. We're paying a lot of money and we're getting a bad outcome for the injured worker. It's everything in between. It's, it's so much of what we do. You go, to, you go to universities. We fund higher education, third highest in the nation, yet we have some of the, some of the highest tuitions that are in state universities. It's the inefficiency in between of government. And until you address that, you could do a program here or there to help some sort of system. But most entrepreneurs, they just want to have a good, healthy business environment overall for them. They don't want to have the pay to play. They don't want to have to deal with corruption. They don't want to, want to have to hire the right lobbyists in order to get common sense legislation passed in Springfield. And that's what we have now. CEOs, and I, I've talked to them. They don't want to say, they don't want to bark too loudly because they think somebody in, in, in the city or at the state is going to come down and pass some legislation or do something. And they're just quiet, 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 quiet. And when they have the chance, they're gone. And all this stuff is important, but man, it comes to corruption. I, I, I talk to medium sized businesses. They're just sick of it. People in the city of Chicago, they're sick of having to hire the right person to appeal their property taxes in order to get you know, what they feel is a fair property tax rate. It's, it's everywhere, which is why it just comes back to corruption. Um, do you want to respond? Yeah, uh, we do have to start looking at insurance reform. And I've been talking about that. We have to make sure that uh, people can afford not only health insurance, but we can also, they can afford uh, insurance rates for workman's comp. I, I do agree with that. I work one of the top five, top 10 most dangerous jobs, uh, depending on what year the review is coming out or the survey is coming out. And our workman's comp rates are staggering to the point where if you have an injury, there are many of these contractors that are closing the doors because they just can't afford to do business anymore. So we need insurance reform because it is a, a detriment. We're seeing doctors leave Illinois because of medical malpractice insurance rates. Uh, 
Uh, I, I've talked to one that ended up going over to Indiana because they just could not afford to do business within the practice here. So they ended up going to Indiana as a cardiologist and their medical malpractice went down significantly. So yeah, insurance does need reforms and we need to make sure, and I don't take any money from insurance companies. So I have no problem fighting against insurance companies and making sure that they're held accountable and make sure that it is equitable for businesses going forward. And we, we also need to work on different platforms on trying to drive business in. Like I said, with Indiana, it could create other, other economic growth by making sure that people are sourcing materials here in Illinois. They're not sourcing materials from overseas. They're not sourcing materials coast to coast. They're sourcing materials and we're creating a support system for that business here in the state of Illinois. It just creates more business opportunities. And we have to make sure that we're not losing all of our high school and, and college graduates. We need the best workforce. And if we're losing them, that's not happening. That's what drives people in too, having the best workforce. Because if you have a, a productive and a successful workforce, you have an opportunity for good benefits. You have an opportunity to be successful as a business. Okay. Well, anything you want to respond to there, uh, Representative Bandy? Yeah, I mean, the, 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 the issue is, is more, than, more than insurance companies. We have a very litigious system, and there's people that benefit by having a very litigious system in the state. And the speaker has benefited from the system being how it is. And until you address that, we're not going to be able to address these issues. So I want to talk, turn to the issue of, of property tax. And again, I know Representative Van Dyke is something you, you've talked a lot about. And um, again, I think the, the basic argument from uh, from Democrats is that you know, if especially with something like the graduated income tax, if you're able to uh, invest more in things like public education, then uh, that should benefit uh, middle and lower income individuals who property taxes are a lot higher, especially when it comes to they look at their property tax bill, and it's mostly their local school district that's making up a, a good percentage of it. Um, do you, you know, is there anything wrong with that argument? And if not, what do you think? If so, what do you think uh, should be done about uh, reducing property taxes? Mr. Bet uh, Representative Batten, that's you. Oh, I'm sorry, I thought you said Representative, Representative Batten. Um, <laughs> so I voted for the change in the school funding formula, um, which, which I think was important, but we have a system right now where we have a lot of have and have not school districts. One of the things Minnesota does is they share their commercial property tax wealth statewide. So uh, there's the issue with, with the power plants and, and you can have two districts right next to each other. And if the power plant is on this side of the school district line, they get all the wealth from that power, from that, from that, uh, from that property tax bill then the school district next to it is poor. So one has, there's a school district in Juliet that I think spends $30,000 per student, whereas Plainfield spends about $10,000 per student. That inequity doesn't, doesn't make sense. So one of the things Minnesota does is they share commercial property tax wealth statewide. The funding formula change was important, but the other one is 30% of Chicago is tipped. Uh, I think the Magnificent Miles in a tip district, that money then doesn't go to, uh, to Chicago public schools, which Chicago has, most people would say, the most valuable real estate in the state, yet somehow they're considered in the poorest category of schools. So that diverts state money to Chicago school, to the Chicago public school district instead of to suburban and downstate school districts. And that whole cycle needs to, need, needs to get fixed. So you need uh, more funding from the state and stable funding from the state by leveling out all these, all, these, all these ups and downs. On top of which, just even things like work comp reform. I had a study done right when I took office that there's hundreds of millions of dollars of savings to state and local government because you know, a school district has to pay work comp costs. Uh, a village has to pay work comp costs. Um, our credit rating at the uh, state of Illinois being so bad actually affects what what local municipalities pay in bonding. So there's a lot of money that's spent at the state yeah. level or at the local level because of things that the state has done. Okay. All right, Mr. Benson, um, I know there's something your campaign talked about. So how, how do you reduce property taxes here in Illinois? Well, uh, we need to make sure that there's, there's funding across the state. And again, that goes back to uh, auditing the budget and making sure that we, we don't have wasteful spending. Uh, I'm all for taking a look at con consolidation of government. We have one of the, the highest rates of taxing bodies in the country. So 
there's a lot of crossover within municipalities. There's a lot of crossover with uh, townships. There's a lot of crossover within uh, uh, these school districts. We have some school districts. Well, we have a, specifically, we have one of the smallest school districts in Illinois with a superintendent that's making uh, over $200,000 a year with 99 students, 11 teachers in one building. We need to take a look at that because that is just a detriment on taxpayers. Uh, we also, we have to start looking at the pensions too. I mean, you know, there's, there were a lot of mistakes on both sides of the aisle in the past, and we have a huge, huge deficit within these pensions. Uh, we need to make sure that there's obligations with that too, because the, you know, the teachers, the teachers are paying in nine to 11% of their own funds and, and they need to make sure that they have that, uh, that responsible retirement and respectful retirement when they go to retire, because uh, we also don't want to see uh, a lot of these, a lot of these teachers and people retiring, leaving the state and going somewhere else because it's, it's not uh, cost effective to stay here. So if they take a huge hit in their, their pension, they're more than likely that they're just going to move away. So, right. so, so this has obviously been the pension issue has been a perpetually vexing uh, issue here in Illinois. But what, what specifically do you think has to happen then for, uh, to solve that issue? Well, uh, we just need to take a look at it and make sure that everybody's equitable. Everybody has a seat at the table, and we we start working at it at a bipartisan level instead of pointing fingers. We need uh, the teachers there. We need uh, all the state workers. We need people at the table. We also need to, to start looking at this federal funding. Right now, the stimulus package is, is being uh, held hostage by the election. That could be a potential of 10,000 jobs, or 10% uh, of the jobs within the public sector being lost. These are firefighters, these are police officers, these are teachers. Uh, we need to start getting that funding. We are a payer state. I'm getting sick and tired of being a payer state. We are seeing less money coming in and going out. And then we've got uh, states like Kentucky that are seeing billions of dollars coming in more so than what they're paying in. We're seeing Texas that are seeing, is seeing an exponential amount of money coming in rather than paying in, but we're getting, we're getting the bill. So we need to make sure that we do stand up and we start getting our fair share of money back uh, from the federal government to get back on track with budgets, but we have to do the audits. We have to make sure that we get rid of wasteful spending. And again, the, the consolidation, we have to take a look at consolidation and make sure that uh, the level of taxing bodies are, are minimized because that's what's putting a lot of the burden on us. And uh, Cook County and the Collar Counties, we are not getting our fair share of money back. We are completely subsidizing other parts of the state. So how do you make sure that schools are funded and how do you make sure that your local municipality has the money for the services if you're paying for somebody else? You're not even keeping the money within your community. You're ending up paying for somebody else in another region of the state. I, I want to give Representative Bannock an opportunity to address the, the pension issue. Sure, pension. So I was the I was the point, the Republican point person and worked with the administration and Democrats on the local pension consolidation bill, which will save the um, save local taxing bodies quite a bit of money. And it, the, 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 the downside of it is that it eliminates what was going to be an increasing pressure. It's not like it's this big savings. It was going to, it probably more than anything mitigates um, bad things from happening at the, at the local level. Um, at the, at the state level, as you know, I was the one that came up with the idea for the, uh, lump sum optional buyout, which actually has been overprescribed and they've had to issue more bonds to, um, help people with that, which has been a big savings at the state level, but we need to stop skipping payments. And, and one of my frustrations, and I made a video on this with the, if, 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 if the, if, if the fair tax proponents were going to use more of the money to, 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 to fix the. Uh, to fix our biggest debt, which is our pension debt is essentially a credit card bill because it essentially comes at a seven to a seven and a quarter percent interest rate because that's the assumed rate of return you'd be getting if the money was still in there. So when you borrow from it, you pay it back a year later, you have to pay a dollar plus the seven, seven and a quarter percent interest. So it's our highest interest debt and we've never tackled that seriously. We need to prioritize front loading instead of having a ramp where we're skipping payments still and then 
getting up. We need a front load and flatten that ramp out so we're on something sustainable. That's actually a long-term plan that takes, the problem is, is it, it takes some serious, serious work uh, and, and funding pensions isn't something that you do a ribbon cutting at, but, but we should because a dollar that we put into getting the pension system stabilized now is going to allow us to have more money three, four, five, six years down the road. And we've been kicking the can, kicking the can, kicking the can down the road. And I want to say there is a year somewhere in the next 20 years where we're supposed to make, you know, a, a 40, $45 billion pension payment, which is just going to be, is going to be unrealistic. So you need to front load the pensions, get it under control. You need to do something about, you know, the people who work for a day and then got a full pension, uh, some of those things. But we actually have done some things. We can expand the buyout. Um, it's been a success. And I, I know I've worked with the administration on ways to expand the buyout. We were working on that before the pandemic hit and everything kind of went, went chaotic. Um, so there's more that you can do with, with the buyouts, but we need to get serious about paying off our biggest credit card bill. Okay, so you mentioned the pandemic, and obviously this is uh, something that's- there Real quick, Alex, sorry, sure. I don't mean to- Real quick. Uh, and I, I do agree with that. We need to take a look at the uh, pension manipulation too with people getting ready to retire, increasing salaries, it's happened on a regular basis. We need to make sure that people aren't abusing the system or getting multiple pensions within a, the public sector. Uh, we need to make sure that uh, going forward that reform is taken care of and we do have to put the money into the pension system because we're constantly trying to catch up with those interest rates. Because for years there were municipalities that were paying in a third, they weren't paying uh, what they were supposed to be paying. They weren't maintaining their obligations. And and there is an obligation with the, in, in the uh, IMRF system and the IMRF system is, is a lot better funded. Uh, we need to make sure that those obligations are being put in place to make sure that they do pay in and they do front load and they do start making up some of that difference in the interest. Because if you see seven to possibly 10% when markets are doing great, we are catching up and we're paying two to three times as much to try to catch up with that compounding interest. Okay. All right. So I want to talk about, uh, obviously this novel coronavirus pandemic that has uh, upended so much of our lives. Um, Representative Bannock, I want to start with you kind of, uh, I think you were one of the first persons that I spoke to that, you know, kind of realized the, the seriousness of, of this, of this issue. Um, but obviously in the several months since then, you know, the state government has uh, garnered a lot of criticism for how they've handled this. So I just want to kind of hear your overall assessment of how um, specifically Governor Pritzker, the IDPH and the state has handled this pandemic. Yeah, I'll, I'll, you know, I had said this in one of the other interviews, I, I gave the administration a B. Um, certainly, when you do things quickly in the, in the beginning of the pandemic, when you do things hastily, it's never going to be perfect. And there certainly weren't things that were perfect. Um, but um, I obviously worked closely with the governor. I was the, the first state official to push for the use of, of face masks publicly. Um, it took us a little bit longer to, to do those. I think that was good. I think getting organized and, and taking things seriously and closing the schools and some of the stuff were good things. I think on the downside, having everybody just go to the big boxes or the grocery stores without a mask um, probably didn't make sense. We'll never do that again. The idea that you could buy shoes at Walmart, but you couldn't buy shoes at a local shoe store doesn't make sense because you're actually crowding people together. So from a science standpoint, it's actually better to spread people out. And the simple option is, is if, if, if shoes aren't essential, which I, I would think clothing would be, but if you can't buy it at the local shoe store, you shouldn't be able to buy it, buy it at Walmart. Um, I think the biggest criticism I have, though, is that we've been in session five days since the pandemic hit. And there are too many things and decisions that are being made without a public hearing. So we should be, we want to hear from the epidemiologists. I always hear, well, we're listening to the experts, we're listening to the experts. But as a policymaker, you have to listen to several experts. So you want to hear from the epidemiologist about how we stop the spread of COVID. But you also want to hear from the child psychiatrist, what is the effect of this person not being in school? You also want to hear from the uh, from from somebody that deals with suicides because we've had you know concerns about suicide go go up. We've had domestic violence go up. There's been a lot of downsides to the lockdown, and there's no good answer to everything. And no one's ever going to be happy. And and no one's ever going to be happy with the regions 
and there has to be boundaries. There's state boundaries, there's county boundaries. We made these regions, we went through mitigation and people were frustrated by it, you know, because, hey, across the street, I could eat outside, but here I can't. It's never gonna be perfect because you, it, there, there has to be some, some, some set of rules that you follow. But it's, it, what's disappointing is that we haven't been in Springfield for those public hearings because there are things you can do for, for two weeks, there are things you can do for two months, but maybe you can't do them for two years. There are special, my, my wife's a special education teacher. If a special education kid goes without in-class learning for two years, there's gonna be a human toll on that person's life. There's a human toll to, um, to a lot of the mitigations in terms of life expectancy. I mean, and, and you're, you're, you're likely to see the income gap grow. And as the income gap, gap, gap grows, Higher income people in the United States live significantly longer than lower income people. So a family that has the ability to hire a tutor or that is more stable is, is, is going to have a better outcome with e-learning, for example, than maybe the single mom with four kids that's trying to, that's trying to run a business, which is a real story of somebody that, I, that, I, that I've spoken with. So I wish that we had, we're seven, eight months into this thing, I really wish we had more public hearings on this. I really wish there was more legislative input to it. Now that's up to the speaker to call us back down. The, uh, the governor is making the decisions based on, on, the, on the information he has, but I feel that he would benefit hearing from a diverse group of people from around the state. So if there was a big shortfall, it's the fact that we haven't been doing things down in, down, down in Springfield. Okay, all right, Mr. Benton, I wanna hear your assessment of how the state government's doing and, and should to uh, your opponent's point. Uh, there be more legislative input on uh, on these issues. Yeah, uh, so uh, we know that the, the cards were dealt and nobody's had this hand before. Um, I commend the state and IDPH and I commend uh, the governor for following the experts and pushing the politics aside and stepping aside and letting the epidemiologists speak and IDPH. Uh, one of the issues that we've had is there's a lot of uh, local municipalities that are not following the IDPH guidelines. And then we've seen spikes in the past. We've seen people that are uh, refusing to wear masks. Uh, there are extremists that are holding rallies with no masks and, and full reopens, uh, which is not following the science at all, which is not putting people's health first. And there, we have to do what the science is telling us to do and people are struggling and I hate to see people struggling. And I, I agree with my opponent with, with IEPs, there's a, a lot of crucial therapies that need to be taking place right now. There needs to be interaction with uh, children that do have special needs. Uh, they need to be in uh, school right now when we've seen districts that are pushing out a plan to get them back in school to get them back on track. Uh, we've dealt with it with my, in my own family. My daughter has a speech delay and we've had major issues going back and forth with that because of the, the pandemic. We need to take a look at the mental health. I've talked to mental health specialists. I've been out uh, talking to people on a regular basis and, and mental health is a major issue right now. Uh, but we also need to remember that there were thousands of people who died. There were thousands of people who became infected. There are thousands of people that could potentially be considered pre-existing conditions and, and lose access to their health care uh, because they lost their jobs and they don't have health care and now they're high risk and they have pre-existing conditions they can be uh, denied. Do we want to expand that? Do we want to uh, put people at risk where they're going to see more COVID outbreaks? Uh, and, and my opponent called for a full reopen back in June, back in June. That's not following the science. And uh, yeah, no, I didn't. yes, you did. It was, it was printed June 12th. Oh, okay. Well, actually, if you want to respond to that, go, yeah. go ahead, Representative Bannon. But um, I, I want to ask Representative Bannon. Yeah. Okay. Representative Bannon, I want to ask you, feel free to respond to that as well. But I also want to ask you kind of about his point about um, the politicization of this pandemic. And, you know, again, I want to be very clear that you were one of the ones who took this very seriously from the start. You advocated for masks, all, all that. Um, you took it very seriously. But, and I think it's fair to say this, there were a lot of people with, who, who were in your party um, who have very much, I've heard, openly question 
you know, the validity of scientific data and who have, uh, you know, there have been other Republican candidates who have held uh, indoor fundraisers without masks, you know, and, and it, there does seem to be this polar, the polarization has very much hit this pandemic. So um, how, how do you address that? Where, where do you think that comes from? Is this a problem uh, as much as people say it is? Oh, it, 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 it's been a problem. I, I, I would have uh, I would have thought this would have been more of a uniting moment for us as a country. It certainly hasn't made it made it not easy on easy on me. Um, I, I, I got a lot of I got a lot of hate mail, hate email, hate Facebook messages for pushing for the use of face masks. Um, and the virus certainly is not political, but the, the situation, like unfortunately, so many things has been politicized. Um, and I, and, 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 and for, for the wrong reasons, I think there's a, there's a few states and I don't follow closely, you know, day to day what other states have done, but I know there's yeah, a Republican governor in Ohio that's took a little bit more of a middling ground, maybe the one in Massachusetts and, and whatnot. I've just, I've just, tr I've just tried to follow all the science uh, on this and I'm, I'm not sure what my opponent is referring to in June. I think the, the, uh, uh, one of the things that I came out and, and said was the example I used to use you gave you before is that small businesses that are following the same social distance mask guidelines that big box stores are should be allowed to be open. Um, but clearly this isn't, this isn't, uh, this is, not a situation where we should just ignore everything. And I, I publicly denounced that from the beginning and I, I follow the data. My concern all along has been, in fact, if you look at, at the letter that I wrote to the governor in mid-April, when I talked about um, uh, pushing for the use of face masks, I mentioned small businesses, but I, but I also mentioned, you know, the suicides, the alcoholism and all those other, all those other downsides. Once again, this is a great reason why we need to have hearings down in Springfield instead of kind of cherry picking these things, it would be, I think it would be beneficial to, I know a lot of my colleagues have come around and said, Hey, you know what? I guess you did your homework. You were right. Um, and, uh, you know, it's unfortunate, but I do a lot of reading. I, 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 I read a lot of research papers and I've kind of tried to follow what, what, uh, what made sense with the scientific data across the board. Okay. All right. Yeah. Uh, 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 can I respond to that, please? Sure, go ahead, real quick. Yeah. Um, so that's Will County Gazette printed an article about a full reopen with Representative Batnick. And we've also had car shows that were going on. We have uh, restaurants within Joliet that are full capacity. People are going inside. We've had it happen here in the village of Plainfield. We've had uh, a letter that was pushed out that they will not follow IDPH guidelines, but recommend mass and social distancing. We have to follow the guidelines and we have to make sure that going forward, we keep people safe. I tried to shut down a car show where there were hundreds of people with no masks out there. And my opponent was out campaigning during it. When we know what's going on, we know the science, we know that there has been thousands of deaths. We have to follow that science and we have to go forward and make sure that we do protect people. Okay, Representative Fanick, do you want to respond to that? Representative Fanick, do you want to respond to that? Yeah, look, there, there's, there, there's this, the science shows that the spread outside is much different than the spread inside. So um, uh, just, it, it's, it's, there, there's been um, literally one of the keys to this is, is, is the fresh outdoor air. So I, I do think the science shows that there's certainly a difference between um, doing things outside and, and, and doing things inside. And when you're inside, you certainly need more, um, more space. The ventilation is an issue, um, but outside is, is certainly a whole bunch more safer than doing things inside. Okay, all right. Uh, we're coming up. People right next to each other is not safe, especially when a, a majority of the people are not wearing masks. Okay, we're, we're coming up in an hour here, so I'm going to yeah. try to wrap this up here. So um, I just want to give you guys the last you know, couple of minutes now here, just give you both the opportunity to make your, your pitch to voters as to why they should um, pick you to represent the 97th district. And uh, Mr. Benton, let's start with you. Yeah, so I'm going to go out there. Um, I'm fighting for you. I've gone out, I've knocked, uh, safely knocked 11,000 doors in 10 weeks. 
I want your voice to be heard. I want to be a good representative for you. I want to work at a bipartisan capacity to make sure that everyone's voice is accounted for, regardless of party affiliation. I am not going to do anything extreme like uh, some extreme politicians have been doing in the past. I want to be middle of the road and work for you and work on income and property tax relief. I want to work on more affordable health care and to protect your rights in health care. I also want to work on a trade vocational initiative to help get shop classes back into schools and help with opportunities to uh, transition some of our youth within good paying jobs and good benefits. And, and I know that because I'm in there and I see it on a regular basis. Uh, we need more people with calluses on their hands down there that are fighting for the people and fighting for the average person instead of fighting for uh, certain donors and PAC groups. And we need regular people that are willing to go out there and fight for everyone. Okay. All right. Representative Bennett. Hey, th I want to thank you very much uh, for, for, for having me on. Um, Look, there's, we're, at, we're at a really partisan time, a uh, really, really divided time. And I hear from a lot of people, I'm, I'm, I'm considered one of the most accessible uh, state reps in the state. Um, and I'm, I'm knocking doors, talking to people and doing all those things. But they always hear that they want people to go down there and solve problems and work in a bipartisan way. That's what I've done. When I, when I agree with the other side, I work with them, whether it's, whether it's been writing an op-ed about gerrymandering with Kelly Cassidy, who's one of the most considered one of the most liberal members, whether it's working with the, with the governor on COVID. When I disagree, I let them know I disagree, but I do it in a respectful way. But most importantly, I work for, for, for you, the voter. When a big issue, is, a issue has come up, I've not hidden. I've not hidden from the pension crisis. I've not hidden from the budget crisis. And I was certainly out, out front on COVID. And I am somebody that has provided unique solutions to the, to, uh, to the issues facing the state. And when I hear at the doors, the type of things everybody wants out of a, a representative, that's what I've been doing. So I certainly would appreciate your help. So thank you. Thank you, gentlemen, both for uh, taking the time and talking to us. Mr. Betnick, Mr. Benton, I appreciate it. Best of luck on the campaign trail and stay safe. Thank you. Thank you.